and grateful for your word that you've allowed it, allowed to be recorded over a period of 1,500 years. And so you've done a lot to uh, encapsulate your truth for us. And so the least we could do is give ourselves to your word and study it and try to learn what it says. So to that vein, I pray you'll be with us uh, during Sunday school and in the main service that follows so we can learn the things you'd have for us in your word, um, claiming your promise this morning that your word equips us not for some good works, but for every good work. So we just ask that the Holy Spirit would be illuminating your truth today as it's taught, and I pray that we would leave here different people, change people, uh, having understood in a better way your mind on things. So we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Well, if you could locate the Gospel of Luke and open up to chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. If you need a handout, Don in the back will help you with that. Just put your hand up. And we will give you a paper handout, not a financial one. Luke chapter 2, verses 31 through 32, continuing on with our study on angelology. Having uh, spoken of the good angels and Satan, we're now sort of in a section dealing with demons. We've looked at the existence of demons. They're clearly spoken of, Old Testament and New. Uh, we've looked at the origin of demons. Their best guess is they are the one-third of the angels that fell with Lucifer. And we've seen that demons have the elements of personhood, although they're not human beings, obviously. They're real personalities. And then we've looked at the characteristics of demons, the different really vile terms that the Bible uses to describe them. And then we've seen that they have much, they're much more powerful than us in every way, but obviously they're not as powerful as God is. And then we took a look at their works and some of the things that they do, including allowing people to traffic in what is called the occult. And then from there we moved into the subject of demon possession. Made some, a lot of comments about demon possession, uh, even looked at the characteristics of demon possessed people. Last week, I think it was, making the case that a Christian cannot be demon possessed, although a Christian can be oppressed or uh, influenced by the realm of demons. And from there, we're at the last part of this material on, on demonology where we're looking at the defense. I mean, if demons are, and Satan are really as powerful as the Bible presents them, how do we defend ourselves? So the first thing to understand is that when it comes to defending ourselves in the area of spiritual warfare, God is already doing stuff. Even before we do our part, which we'll talk about, God is already doing things to protect us, which I'm very grateful for, aren't you? So what is God doing? Well, for one thing, he's already put up restraint on Satan. And we know that from early Job. Job chapter one, verse 10, uh, this was Satan's complaint to God concerning Job when God was bragging about Job to Satan. And so be careful when God starts bragging about you. If God is ever bragging about me, I would like him to not do it in the presence of Satan. But it says there in verse nine, then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? And then it says in Job one verse 10, have you not made a hedge? That's a very important word about him and his house and all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. So Satan 
could not do what he wanted to do to Job because God had placed a hedge of protection around Job's life. And I don't see how that's changed for us today because we obviously wouldn't even be meeting here given the power of Satan and his hatred for what we're doing here. So there must be obviously some kind of protection that God is doing. Satan can't just do whatever he wants to us. And one of the things that inhibits Satan is the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7. And this is the passage that tells us that Satan, yes, he's the ruler of this world, but not in an absolute sense. There are handcuffs on Satan as I speak. Beyond divine restraint, God is doing something else for us that I'm very, very grateful for. He's interceding for us or he's praying for us. And it always makes us feel good when you know you're going into a difficult situation but you've got a a person or two praying for you, that's always comforting. And yet what the Bible tells us is Jesus and, uh, and the Holy Spirit, two members of the Trinity, are praying for us around the clock. Are you happy about that? That makes me very happy. Uh, And you see this mindset in Christ even during his earthly ministry in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, where Jesus tells Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Kind of the uh, accusation that Satan brought up to God concerning Job. And then in verse 32, Jesus tells Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have have turned again, will strengthen your brothers. In other words, I'm praying for you throughout this ordeal that you're about to go through. And I'm praying that you come out of it and you're going to be better for it because you're going to be a, a better minister or a better strengthener of your brothers because of it. And Peter went through what he went through and survived it and actually became a better person for it because of the prayer life of his Savior for him. And that's why Peter, in his little epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, three decades later when Peter wrote 1 Peter, would say this concerning us, that we are those who are protected, 1 Peter 1, 5, by the power of God through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. So as we're on our way to our inheritance, we are currently being protected by the power of God. And so Peter would know something about that, having received in Luke 22 this information from Jesus that he was going into a trial, and yet the Lord was praying for him. So not only is the Lord acting as a restraint against Satan, he's interceding for us as we go through difficulties uh, in life. And Jesus, in what is called the upper room discourse, prayed, you might want to flip over to John 17, verse 15, prayed what really is the Lord's Prayer. Most people mislabel the Matthew 6 prayer as the Lord's Prayer, and that really isn't the Lord's Prayer. It couldn't be the Lord's Prayer because there's a provision in it that says forgive us of our sins. I mean, Jesus wouldn't have prayed that for himself. He was instructing the disciples to pray, but if you really want the Lord's Prayer, it's in in the upper room, right near the end of his life. life prior to his crucifixion in the Passion Week. And uh, it's fascinating to work through this. We've done it when we study John's gospel in this church. But one of the things he says in John 17, verse 15, as he's praying to the Father, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. That would be us, the future church. I ask that you do not take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. So Jesus prayed for Peter, and there he's praying for his future church just before his his death. And then Jesus died, 
and he rose from the dead, as you know, and he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And so what's he doing at the right hand of the Father? Just kind of sitting around and doesn't have anything to do, right? No, he's entered into his high priestly ministry. He's not functioning as Davidic king, but he is functioning as high priest, not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of who? Melchizedek, and if you want a good book to study on that, it would be the book of Hebrews. I think one of our ladies' classes is currently going through the book of Hebrews. And one of the things Jesus is doing in that high priestly ministry is he's involved in a ministry of intercession. And notice, if you will, uh, Romans chapter 8. Actually, let's not do Romans chapter 8. Let's look at Hebrews 7 just for a minute. Hebrews chapter 7, and notice one of the many things Jesus Christ is doing currently right now as I speak, because we know a lot about what he did in 2,000 years ago. We know a lot about what he will do when he comes back, what we're kind of blinded to for whatever reason. And most systematic theologies, unless they're dispensational theologies, don't even go into this. Uh, what is he doing right now, which is what we call his present session, as he's functioning as high priest after the order of Melchizedek, one of the things he's doing is intercession. And Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives. Now, if someone lives for something, that means it's like the most important thing in their life. You got a lot of people that live for the weekends, right? If someone says, I live for the weekends, then the weekend is the most important thing in their life. And here we learn what Jesus lives to do. What's the most important thing in his life now at the Father's right hand? It says, since he always, not sometimes, and this, this is what makes his priesthood different than Aaron's. The Aaronic priests had to retire at a certain age. The Aaronic priests would have to go to sleep, you know, to recharge the battery. But Jesus doesn't have to do any of those things. He doesn't have to retire. He doesn't have to go to sleep. So he's available around the clock to do, to do the very thing that he lives to do. And what he lives to do is right there in Hebrews 7, verse 25. Since he always lives to what? Make intercession for them. Them is us, members of the church. What is intercession? Intercession, when you intercede for somebody, you're praying, on be you're praying essentially to God the Father on behalf of a third party. That's what intercessory prayer is. And here we learn that this is part of Christ's high priestly ministry, and it's the very thing that he lives to do, and he always does it. So that, if that doesn't communicate divine restraint on Satan's activities, I don't really know what will. Um, now let's go to the book of Romans for a second. Take a look at Romans chapter 8. And notice, if you will, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather was raised, who was at the right hand of God, which is his ministry that we just described, and who also does what? Intercedes for who? For us. So you take Hebrews 7.25 and you put it right next to Romans 8 verse 34 and you learn that Jesus is doing something right now called divine intercession. And it's not just the Son, God the Son, who's doing this. When you go to, over to Romans 8, same chapter, verses 26 and 27, what you learn is that there's an entirely different member of the Trinity interceding for us also. And notice what it says in Romans 8, 26 and 27. It says, in the same way, the Spirit also, also relative to what? Relative to what Jesus is doing in verse 34. 
in the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. Boy, I, we've got a lot of weaknesses, don't we? So there's someone that's helping us in the midst of our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should. Uh, you know, you think of all of the things going on in the spiritual realm, all of the methods of Satan, all of the attacks that come against us. I mean, I, as a human being, I have no, no way of navigating my way through any of that. I don't even know how to pray for myself most of the time. But someone helps. It says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself, what, intercedes for us, and then it says, with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he, what, intercedes for, uh, for the saints. Now, who are the saints? That's us. As J. Vernon McGee says, you're either a saint or you're an ain't, right? If you're in Christ, you're a saint because the positional righteousness of Jesus has been transferred to us at the point of faith. And so the Holy Spirit intercedes for us according to what I want him to do for me, right? No, it doesn't say that. Verse 27, end of the verse, according to who? The will of God. So isn't this a fascinating um, uh, discourse on Trinitarianism where we have one God, we believe in monotheism, but that one God has expressed himself in three personages, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all sharing in the essence of deity But at the same time, the Son is completely unique in his sonness. The Spirit is completely unique in his spiritness. And the Father is completely unique in his fatherness. And it's the mystery of the Trinity. And here we learn that two members of the Trinity, first the Son, Romans 8.34 and Hebrews 7.25, second member of the Trinity, And also the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 26 and 27, are both involved in the active ministry of intercession, petitioning God the Father on behalf of a third party. And who is that third party? It's little old me and little old you. And so this is just a fascinating uh, information the Bible has given us concerning the restraint that God has already providing in our lives. So God right now is doing two things to protect us from Satan even before we do anything to protect ourselves. We have the hedge of protection which cannot be lowered without his divine sovereignty and then we have this valuable ministry of intercession by two members of the Trinity as they intercede for us according to the will of God to God the Father. So I don't know, I feel pretty safe. I mean, we've got a pretty good security team at this church, but not, not this good. So having said all that, let's move away from God, what God is already doing for us in the area of spiritual warfare to now what we should do for ourselves. So just because God is already doing for us to protect us in the midst of spiritual warfare doesn't mean I just sit, soak, and sour and fold my hands and sit down and say, you know, God's doing his thing, I'm just going to do whatever I want. That's not what the Bible teaches either. Because the Bible does teach through our own behavior, we can open the door to satanic activity. So what am I supposed to do? Well, there are at least five things that we are supposed to do. The first of which is to understand something that most spiritual warfare models, books, or teachings don't really communicate well, in my opinion, because many of them come from sort of a hyper-charismatic background where they're not clear on the dispensations of the Bible. And so you get a lot of teaching about we've got to bind Satan, we've got to cast Satan out of here, uh, we've got to kind of get together and pray down the territorial spirits over Houston, 
Because after all, Houston has the biggest Planned Parenthood. And so if we would all, as Christian leaders, all get together and we would pray down that territorial spirit, abortion would disappear in Houston. And, you know, we've got to give the devil a black eye and run him out of town. And, of course, you know, Jack Hayford, who has a lot of good things to say, Church on the Way, was doing all of this stuff in the 80s and the 90s, praying down territorial spirits over Los Angeles. I have a feeling that those territorial spirits haven't moved one millimeter in Los Angeles when you look at the state of Los Angeles today, ironically called the city of the angels, not exactly the most angelic place on planet earth. If you are a dispensationalist, you understand that we're in the church age and we're in a time period where Satan is the prince and power of this air, of, of the world, with limitations as we've described. So we don't waste our time binding Satan, yelling at Satan, screaming at Satan. We don't waste our time praying down territorial spirits over Houston or Sugarland. We understand that we are primarily on defense. Offense takes place when Jesus comes back and establishes his kingdom. So when Jesus, and only when he comes back and establishes his kingdom at the end of the tribulation period, which is not now, and this is where your millennial view, if you're confused on the millennium, you'll get confused in spiritual warfare. When Jesus returns and establishes kingdom at the end of the tribu tribulation period, premillennialism is the way we teach it here, and we're teaching the book of Revelation, which goes perfectly with what I'm saying here, then and only then will Satan be bound. And after the thousand years runs its course, as we've studied, Satan is kept around for pedagogical reasons, and then finally Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. So Satan's defeat basically has seven steps to it. First, he's evicted out of heaven. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, we've studied those passages. Then there's the pronouncement given to him in Eden that there's coming one from the seed of the woman, Jesus, who's going to crush his head. And then Satan is running a genetic experiment prior to the flood that failed. Now, you say, well, what's that all about? Well, I'm going to have more to say about that than you'll want to know a couple weeks down the road. Satan is defeated at the cross. But it's not until the midpoint of the tribulation period that he permanently loses access to heaven. Because he can still go into heaven to accuse and to communicate. He just can't go into heaven to worship and serve as he once was able to do as a high-ranking cherub. And then after the tribulation period runs its course, Jesus will establish his kingdom. And then at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, Satan will be bound. And at the end of the millennial kingdom, he'll be cast into the lake of fire. So we are still waiting for events six and seven to happen. In fact, we're actually waiting for events five, six, and seven to happen. So we're living really in between event four and event five in the progressive defeat of Satan. We are not in the kingdom now. We are in the church age. Satan is a defeated foe, but his sentence hasn't been imposed. So therefore, it's a complete waste of time to try to do something to Satan, like binding him, etc., that only Jesus can and will do when he establishes his kingdom. But in the interim, as we're waiting for those things to happen, God has left us with defenses. And one of those defenses is simply to understand that we're on defense. Because Revelation 11, verse 15 hasn't been fulfilled yet. The kingdom of, of this world has not become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The events of the book of Revelation bring that to pass, but we're living in a time period before those events have taken place. And that's why I like to make a big deal, and I won't walk through every single one of these, but the parallels between the book of Ex Exodus and the various judgments in the book of Revelation. 
there's no doubt that when you read the book of Revelation, it sounds an awful lot like the book of Exodus. And uh, sores, rivers to blood, darkness, frogs, hail, etc. You'll find those in the various bowl judgments in Revelation and in the various 10 plagues in the book of Exodus. And I think the reason the Spirit of God, when he inspired the book of Revelation, gave us these parallels is to show us something here. That just as the 10 plagues liberated Israel from 400 years of Egyptian bondage, the 21 judgments in the book of Revelation are liberating the entire planet from the grip that it's been under, the satanic dominion that it's been under ever since the fall in Eden. And these judgments haven't taken place yet. So we're living in a time period where Satan largely, unless God puts you know, hedge, a hedge of protection around, intercedes, etc., Satan, we're living in his heyday. We're living almost at the zenith, if you will, of his power. And as I speak, he is still the prince of this world, the god of this age, the prince and power of the air, the one that we wrestle with. He's the one that roams about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And 1 John 5 verse 19 says the whole world lies in his lap. And so the very first thing to understand when dealing with spiritual warfare is you have to understand our defensive posture, okay? We are not on offense, we are on defense. And when you understand that, it gets rid of all of this silly talk about screaming at Satan, yelling at Satan, talking to Satan, giving Satan a black eye and running him out of town, binding Satan, praying down territorial spirits over your city when there's no instructions in the epistles to do anything like that. In fact, uh, I think it was Gabe that was teaching the book of Jude. And over in the book of Jude, verse 9, you read something that Michael himself would not even do relative to Satan. Notice, if you will, Jude, verse 9. And notice what it says. But Michael, the archangel, so Michael's not just an angel, but he's an archangel. When he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, he did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment or accusation, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. So not even Michael himself, as an angel and an archangel, wanted to get into any conversation with Satan or to pronounce any railing accusation against Satan. He simply put Satan in God's hands, and if our power is less than Michael's, which it obviously is, how much more should we be following that mindset and wait on Jesus himself to bind Satan and ultimately cast him into the lake of fire. And in fact, if you're in a ministry or following a ministry which is engaging in all of this aggressive behavior against Satan, that ministry has more in common with false teachers than it does the truth. Where am I getting this from? I'm getting it from 2 Peter chapter 2, just to the left there, a few books. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. It says, especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority, daring self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Reviling or slandering Satan is offensive activity against Satan. Talking to Satan, yelling at Satan, screaming at Satan, binding Satan, etc. And then verse 11 says, For his angels who are greater in might and power, like Michael, we just read about in Jude, do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. So Peter here in chapter 2 is describing false teachers and how they act. So if you're doing all of this offensive activity against Satan, then your ministry has more to do with a false teacher than it does uh, someone that understands the true nature of spiritual warfare. 
So we're not to bring railing accusations against Satan and his minions. We have no biblical basis for that. Even some of the songs we sing, I remember we used to sing a song in, in a church when I was a kid. It went something like that. If the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a tack and, you know, those kinds of things. And they're, all, they're very cute because the kids are singing. But you wonder, you know, how biblically informed that kind of a song is. I mean, to me, that kind of a song goes directly against what you read about in Jude and 2 Peter 2, verses 10 and 11. And I have no idea why people would want to talk to Satan anyway. I mean, isn't that what got the human race into all the trouble it got into with Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 2? You know, I read through Genesis 3, the fall of man, and I, I usually can't get beyond verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, and I always wonder why she's talking to him. Why is she even talking to him? Think of the trouble that could be spared, you know, if... Our forebears did not get into conversations uh, with Satan. So there's a lot of confusion today on the issue of spiritual warfare for the simple reason that people don't understand the doctrine of dispensations. And that's why I believe, and I get no remuneration for this plug at all, I just happen to feel it's the best book out there on the subject. It's called Spiritual Warfare. Um, it's by Robert Dean and Thomas Ice. It's gone through three titles. I think the original title was called A Holy Rebellion. Why is it called A Holy Rebellion? Because if you understand spiritual warfare, you're rebelling against, in a holy sense, your three enemies. And what are those three enemies? The world, the flesh, and the devil. So the original title was A Holy Rebellion, A Strategy for Spiritual Warfare. Then the same content was republished under a new title, which I like this title too, Overrun by Demons. The church's new preoccupation with the demonic, and now it just has this third title, Spiritual Warfare. But of all of the spiritual warfare books out there, and there's a lot of them, and I've read a lot of them, I am very drawn to this book because it's the most balanced book. Number one, it's dispensational. So it doesn't get you into all these activities, binding Satan, etc. Number two, it's biblically based because so many spiritual warfare books you read, suddenly the author will start talking about his counseling experiences. And how, you know, this lady from behind the desk got up and... And, you're, and it's all interesting reading, but now you're getting into not what the Bible says. You're getting into personal experiences, and this book doesn't do that. It sticks to the scripture. And the third reason I like it is it has a high view of the sufficiency of the scripture. It basically teaches the idea that what God has given us to defend ourselves in the area of spiritual warfare, one of those things is his written word, is enough or is sufficient. One of the things that we have in spiritual warfare is the shield of faith by which we can distinguish, extinguish, what does it say? Not some, but all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So you don't need to feel like, gosh, what God has given me in spiritual warfare isn't quite enough. I've got to get in touch with some prophet or I've got to get in touch with modern day psychology, or I've got to get in touch with this or that. The reality is God knows our predicament, and he's given us everything we need for all matters of faith and practice, including how we handle spiritual warfare. So the very first thing we do to defend ourselves against Satan is we have to understand that we are defensive in posture. Because we are living in the devil's world. And that cannot change. It doesn't matter how many good people you elect to office. And I'm in favor of doing that, by the way. But that's not going to change. I mean, if Nancy Pelosi gets voted out of power, it's still the devil's world. Amen? I didn't get much of a reaction on that one. 
it doesn't matter how many, you know, it doesn't matter what party controls the White House, it's still the devil's world. Now, in a sense, it does matter what party controls the White House. You ought to be concerned about that. But that's not the change of binding Satan that will be ushered in when Jesus comes back. And this is why we are called what for Christ? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, ambassadors. If I'm America's ambassador to Iran, how would you like that job right now? I'm representing American values on Iranian soil. I'm not on Iranian soil to do regime change. And maybe that wouldn't be half a bad idea when you look at what's going on in Iran right now. But I'm there to represent America on hostile territory. That's why you're called an ambassador. You're, you're representing kingdom values, which are going to come one day, in the devil's world. And so when you understand that, it clears up so much confusion on the issue of spiritual warfare. Now, the second thing we do to defend ourselves is we avoid catering to the flesh. Because every time you take an excursion back to the sin nature, you open up a doorway not for possession but for influence or oppression and a lot of the things that we blame Satan for we've actually brought them on ourselves because we've gone back to the sin nature now I hope by now we all understand that just because we're new creatures in Christ we still have a sin nature is there any disagreement on that in fact, you feel the pull of the sin nature very strongly as you come to Christ because now you've got another nature inside of you that's enlightening you to the fact that there's a struggle. Before you got saved, there wasn't even a struggle. And so Paul, over in Romans 13 and verse 14, after he's revealed to us all of these provisional truths about our identity in Christ, he says at the end of that whole discussion, Romans 13 verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So you mean to tell me that the flesh in regard to its lusts is still in me even though all of these positional truths have been declared about me when I trusted in Christ? as articulated in the book of Romans, and we're saying that's exactly what we're saying. That's exactly what the Bible is saying. The sin nature has not been eradicated. The only difference now is through the provisions that you have in Jesus Christ, you're not a slave to the sin nature, and you have the power to tell the sin nature no. You didn't have that power before. You probably didn't recognize there was a sin nature in you. But now that you're in Christ, you're a new creature, you have the new nature, you have the Holy Spirit, you should not get the impression that the old nature just withers away and dies. It will be there until your dying day or glorification or the rapture of the church, whichever comes first. And when I go back to the sin nature, which we often do, because the sin nature in involves some excursions and temporary enjoyment. Uh, what does the book of Hebrews say? It talks about Moses who decided to, you know, identify with his people rather, you'll find this in Hebrews 11, rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So there's always the passing pleasure that the sin nature gives. But the end fruit of it is death. And so when I'm tempted to go back to the sin nature, I should tell the sin nature no, but that pull will always be there until my dying day. And here's something to understand. The moment you go back to the sin nature is the moment you just crack the door open for Satan to have an influence over your life. You say, well, where are you getting that from? Well, We've gone through many of these passages already, but the key one is Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, which says, do not let the sun go down on your anger, lest you give the devil a what? A foothold. So there it is in black and white. 
if I go back to the sin nature, suddenly I've cracked the door open just a millimeter for Satan to have an influence over me that he didn't have prior. Uh, other examples of people going back to the sin nature and giving people, uh, giving Satan rather, a millimeter of opportunity was the Apostle Peter. In Matthew 16, 13 through 23, where Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And Peter coughed out the right answer. And Jesus says to Peter, that was revealed to you from above. And he began to pronounce all of these blessings upon Peter. And I think at that point, it probably went to Peter's head a little bit. And so the next time Jesus opened his mouth, Peter thought he was in a position to correct Christ. And the moment he opened his mouth a second time, Jesus said, get behind me, what? Satan. Now, what precipitated that, I, th I personally, doesn't say it as clearly as it could be said, but I think it was pride, given all of the wonderful things that Jesus had spoken about Peter. So, it's very interesting that you can say one thing out of your mouth that glorifies God, and the next thing that comes out of your mouth, you just gave Satan a pulpit or a platform. And that happens to us when we embrace the sin nature, in this case, pride. And I think that's the same kind of thing going on with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, 3 and 4, and Acts 5, 11, where they were tempted to misrepresent their level of generosity to the church. And what we're told there is Ananias and Sapphira, two believers, that Satan had filled, plerao. It's the same verb used to describe the filling of the Holy Spirit in the Christian, in Ephesians 5, verse 18. In this case, it's talking about the filling of Satan. Satan has filled your heart so that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. So there we have three examples in the Bible. Peter, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, Ananias and Sapphira, where they went back to the sin nature and uh, they began to flirt or experiment with the sin nature, and they gave Satan a millimeter of opportunity not to possess them, but to influence them. So the very next thing, besides recognizing that we are on defense, is simply not to cater to the flesh. If you're not perpetually going back to the flesh, the amount of opportunity that Satan has to influence your life starts to shrink uh, dramatically. What is the third thing that we are to do as we embark on, in spiritual warfare is we are to resist the devil. And it is interesting to me that there in the epistles which govern the church as we've talked about there's no information on casting out Satan, binding Satan, talking to Satan, praying down territorial spirits, etc. If you want to know what we do in spiritual warfare, there's just three simple passages. James 4, verse 7. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. And Ephesians 6, verse 13. And all three of those passages say, resist the devil. And I think the James passage says, resist the devil and he will what? He will flee. Now that raises an interesting question. How do I resist the devil? It may have to do with number two there. Because when you study all of those passages in their context, the flesh is mentioned in all of those contexts. So if I'm not experimenting with the flesh, if I'm not going back to the sin nature, then I, in essence, am resisting Satan. I'm playing defense against Satan, and the amount of influence that he has over me begins to shrink at that point. The fourth thing we are to do is we are to understand that we, in spiritual warfare and spiritual combat, are not out there in our own strength. Because you run into people and they'll say, gosh, the Christian life is so difficult. Which I would correct that statement. The Christian life is not difficult. The Christian life is impossible. 
and God understands the impossibility of us living the Christian life through our own strength. If that limitation wasn't there, he wouldn't give us resources to use. So you can't get anywhere in your progressive sanctification in the middle tense of your salvation simply by making the energy of the flesh more active. I've got to do more religious activity. Uh, I've got to work harder. I've got to try harder. And that's not what your Bible says to do. What it says to do, and go with me, if you could, over to Ephesians 6 and verse 13. God never calls us to live the Christian life through our own power. What he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, Therefore take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, Having done everything, stand firm. Actually, the verse I was looking for was verse 10. Finally, be strong. What does it say? In the Lord. Wow. I mean, I forget that so quickly. I, I, I go out and try to be strong, but I'm not doing it in the Lord. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of your own willpower for 2020. No, no. In the strength of his might. Oh, that, well, that would all make sense. I've got, a, I've got an adversary that's far more powerful than me. Uh, the only hope I have is to be strong, not in my own self, but in his power. One of the things to understand about grace is grace, unmerited favor, is not just a yesterday thing. I mean, for years and years in my Christian life, I understood grace as, yeah, I trusted in Christ, I have salvation, I'm not going to hell, I trusted in Christ when I was 16 years, praise the Lord, thank you, Lord, for your grace. And grace is not just a tomorrow thing. Praise the Lord, one of these days I'm going to heaven, glorification. For, for whatever reason, we've got a handle on grace past, handle on grace future, and for whatever reason, we fall short in understanding that grace is a today thing. Grace is a right now thing. Uh, over in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received by which you stand. There it is, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. So in other words, Christian life isn't passive. I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the what? The grace of God with me. So when Paul taught the subject of grace, yeah, he taught it as a yesterday thing and a tomorrow thing. But he talked about it, divine enablement, as a moment by moment thing. And you say, well, I don't really deserve the power to overcome what I have to face in my life. Of course you don't deserve it, because that's the nature of what? Grace, unmerited favor. Uh, over in uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul's instructing Timothy, who's facing a lot of challenges, you therefore, my son, be strong in the, what? Grace that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, Timothy, you want to you successfully pastor the church in Ephesus despite all of these problems and enter heaven fully rewarded? Then you have to tap into grace right now. Not just grace yesterday, not just grace tomorrow, but grace right now. 
And that's why Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his might. 1 John 4 and verse 4 says, Greater is he that not was in you or will be in you, but is in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So how do we engage in spiritual warfare with God doing his part? We understand we're on defense. We avoid going back to the flesh. We resist the devil and he will flee. And we rely upon his resources and understand that he's given us the grace we need for any conflict that you're in, spiritually speaking. And then the last thing we do is we put on the full armor of God. So the big question is, are you dressed for success? Because over in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, are six pieces of armor that we are to appropriate on a moment-by-moment basis. And you say, you're not going to cover all that today, are you? No. But we're going to be moving into the various pieces of armor for spiritual warfare, but before we do that, I just today want to conclude with making eight preliminary observations about the spiritual warfare chapter. And you might want to study this week Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. The first thing to understand about this chapter is Paul is in prison. We know that from Ephesians 3, verse 1. And Ephesians 6 verse 20. And so it's in that place of confinement, his first Roman imprisonment, that he wrote the four prison letters. Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, in that order. And Paul in those other letters makes reference to his imprisonment. Philippians chapter 1 verse 13. I'm of the view uh, that Paul was looking at a member of the Praetorian Guard when he wrote this chapter. Because he talks in the book about of Ephesians and more in the book of Philippians how he was chained to this Praetorian guard, which was sort of the elite guard um, in Caesar's household. You remember that Paul had petitioned a trial before Caesar, which he was allowed to do as a Roman citizen. And so he's in this place of confinement, chained to an elite guard, And it's there he writes these four prison letters. So he's using, I believe, a soldier metaphor here. Um, He's looking at the soldier that he's chained to, and he's developing in it a metaphor for the Christian life. And when you understand those six pieces of armor, you'll understand your present tense grace of God in spiritual warfare. Um, There are six pieces of armor mentioned here. And it's sort of interesting, he says in verse 11, put on the what armor of God? Full armor of God. Now, for years and years in my Christian life, I'd become proficient in one or two pieces of armor. But that's not what the Bible says to do. It says to put on all six pieces of armor. The complete armor of God. The full armor of God. And you have to think the way they thought in Greco-Roman times because armies won or lost based on the quality of their armament. In other words, if you did not have the right sandals, if you did not have the right shield, helmet, that was a game changer in terms of whether you were going to be victorious. And you'll also notice here, and I'm getting this from uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, So I've gone through those first four points, believe it or not. Paul's in prison, soldier metaphor, six pieces of armor described. There's a huge significance of armor in the ancient world. When you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, it's, it's not a suggestion in Greek. It's in the imperative mood. And so when he says, put on the full armor of God, he's not saying, hey, why don't you try this on and see how it works? Why don't you take this out for a little trial and see if it goes well for you? That's not what's communicated here. It's put this on 
or you're going to be defeated. Just like if you went out to war without your armor on in the ancient world, you were as good as dead. Beyond that, bumping up to bullet point number one, and this is where I think a lot of people, and there's a lot of teaching on spiritual warfare and the armor of God, and a lot of it, in my opinion, is misguided because they start the study in Ephesians 6, which is the sin we're committing here. To understand the armor of God, what you have to understand is how Paul is taking prior concepts in the same book. Because do you not agree with me that before chapter 6 comes chapters 1 through 5? So when Paul starts talking about pieces of armor, if you want to understand what this armor is, you trace the same word or the same concept to how it's used earlier in the book. And the error that people make when they teach spiritual warfare concepts is they start to study in Ephesians 6. And they ignore what Paul said prior to Ephesians 6 in chapters 1 through 3. And they go all over the Bible trying to figure out what this armor means. And there's some interesting interpretations of it. Some of it actually could be valuable. But I'm convinced that's not the way to understand this. Because Paul is a logical, linear thinker. When he gets into the subject of the armor, he is developing points and concepts and application and bringing it to a head that had already been discussed in the first five chapters. So as we go through each piece, I'll show you what he's talking about, not based on the book of Leviticus or somewhere and Aaron's robe and all this other stuff, but on what Paul said earlier in the same book. And that really is a very good Bible study methodology to embrace. I talked for a minute earlier about the book of Hebrews, the warning passages. We're not getting into that right now. But when people interpret those warning passages, they take you into every section of the Bible other than the book of Hebrews. And yet if you just pay attention to how the same words are used in those warning passages, elsewhere in the book of Hebrews, you'll understand the warning passages very easily. The MacArthur Study Bible, for example, when it's going through Hebrews 6, which is a very difficult passage, and you look at his notes on Hebrews 6, he takes you everywhere in the Bible other than the book of Hebrews. And that is not good Bible study methodology in the warning passages, and it's not very good Bible study methodology when trying to decipher and analyze and understand these six pieces of armor. So Paul is reinforcing a prior concept. I believe he's putting the, describing the pieces in the order that the centurion, praetorian guard would put those pieces on himself. Because Paul is chained to this guy around the clock. He understood the procedure of how he put on the armor and he saw the order. And so Paul is saying, He's revealing the pieces of armor in that same order. And so for each piece of armor, I'll describe it. I'll talk about what it represents. From which book? The book of Leviticus, no. The book of Isaiah, no. The book of Ephesians, it'll be clear. And then I'll show you how to apply it moment by moment in daily life. So the bottom line to the whole thing is as we move into Ephesians 6 in this section on our study on angelology, demonology, we have to understand that we have six aspects of our weaponry summarizing the key concepts of the letter. Which letter? Ephesians, calling the church to action. And it's interesting that when you study Ephesians 1 through 3, how many commands do we have in chapters 1 through 3? None. You get to Ephesians 4 verse 1, which says, therefore, and when Paul uses the word therefore, you ask, what is the word therefore, what? 
therefore, that switches us from doctrine to practice. You'll see Paul doing that same thing in Galatians 4.1. Therefore, he's taken us out of doctrine, chapters, I'm sorry, chapter 5. Therefore, he's taken us out of doctrine, chapters 1 through 4, and moved us into practice. You'll see Paul doing the exact same thing in the book of Romans. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, brethren, in light of these mercies, what mercies? Everything he got finished telling us in chapters 1 through 11. So when he says, therefore, he's switching us from doctrine to practice. And look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. What do you see there? For this reason, sometimes translated therefore, I'm using the NASB. I, Paul, the prisoner for the sake of you Gentiles. I'm sorry, I wanted Ephesians 4.1. What do you see in Ephesians 4.1? Therefore. So once you get into Ephesians 4 through 6, how many commands do you have in Ephesians 4 through 6? 38. No Greek commands, imperative mood, chapters 1 through 3, 4 through 6, now we've got 38 things to do. From the knowledge base, he's already given us in chapters 1 through 3. And those commands culminate in the spiritual warfare section where he is taking prior concepts, analogizing it to spiritual armor, and telling us specifically what we need to appropriate to enjoy the middle tense grace of God in daily life as we go through spiritual warfare. So you've got here six pieces of armor. Number one, belt of truth. Number two, breastplate of righteousness. Number three, sandals of peace. Number four, shield of faith. Number five, helmet of salvation. Number six, sword of the spirit. And what do these things mean? We have to define them by how Paul has developed those same words, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and spirit in which book of the Bible? The book of Ephesians, particularly Ephesians 1 through 3. And you start to understand that, you see exactly what Paul uh, is telling us to do. So that is the direction that we're going in starting next week. So Give a, give a read, if you could, this week to Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Uh, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for today, grateful for the truth that your word reveals about spiritual combat. We're grateful for grace in the middle tense of our salvation. Uh, help us to be good learners of these things, but beyond just being a learner, your Bible tells us there's a blessing, not just for the hearer, but the doer. And so help us to begin to apply these things to daily life. We'll be careful to get these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Happy intermission.